launching a multiplayer game is really scary. Uh, it's there's no two ways about it. It's a big thing to to cope with because there's a lot of things you don't know about when you're getting ready to launch your game. You don't know how many players you're going to get. Uh, you don't know where your players are going to be from, and you don't know how long they're going to spend in your game, which makes getting ready for it really difficult. Plus, added to that, there's a whole load of other stuff that's going to happen during your launch that you're not going to be prepared for and you're not going to know about until it actually happens. Um, plus, the complications of matchmaking and how to get your, your matchmaker ready, because that's all about compromise. Um, you can have a very few small number of locations so that you get those many players per location so that matchmaking time is really quick. Uh, and but that means it could be more latency, so you've got to work out how to compromise on that. Add into that the complexities of skill-based matchmaking, and it gets even more complicated. So the only constant thing is change. So today I'm going to go through some best practices to learn how to embrace that uncertainty. Uh, and just some of the things that we've learned over the years, uh, being part of multiplayer and now into Unity. So how have I come up with this uh, and how have we learned these best practices? This is through working with all these amazing companies and a lot more over the years. Most recently, I'm sure you'll all be aware of Apex Legends. Uh, Unity and our multiplayer brand were actually responsible for all of the online capacity for Apex Legends and helped them scale that very unexpected mic drop release that they did and helped them scale to over 50 million players within 24 days which is a phenomenal success. You can imagine the, the chaos and the uncertainty that comes with launching a game like that. And actually for it to go flawlessly and for all those players to get a match was a significant accomplishment. Um, so by the end of this, we've got about 20 minutes and someone's gonna keep me on track for time as we go through. Uh, I'm gonna go through some terminology. I'm afraid there's loads of maths I'm gonna go through with you and there's gonna be lots of numbers. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, I'm going to go through what we can actually control when we're getting ready to launch our game, ha how we can actually use what we can control to plan our launch, how we're actually going to budget and understand if we can ever make any money from a, a launch once we've put all that effort into it, and then go through some of the options that are available to developers to get your game into production. So. I'm going to go through some terminology. A lot of you will be really, really familiar with this terminology, but I just want to get everybody talking the same language and using the same phrases for some of the stuff that I'm going to be going through during my talk. So first up, MAU, I'm sure we're all very familiar with this, the number of monthly active users that you have. DAU, daily active users. Um, CCU, connected concurrent users. So that's how many people are actually playing your game at any one time. The PSU is then peak sequential users. So that's the maximum number of people that you'll have in the game at any, over any period. So we'll talk a lot about the daily PSU or the weekly PSU. So the peak number of players that you have and then uh, one slot is the space for one player to join a game. So you'll talk about how many slots you have and then how many players you have. Um, obviously, we're talking about game servers, talking about online games. We're going to be talking about some bandwidth terminology. So kilobits per second per player. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a while. And obviously, the latency, which is the round trip time. So a player pulls the trigger in their game how long does it take for that message to get sent to the server and then back to the player to let them know if they've uh, scored a kill or not. Uh, and talking about servers, we use the terminology servers all the time. Game servers, cloud servers, bare metal servers, server servers. So uh, what we do is we kind of break that down to make it clear what we're talking about uh, in this area. So by game server, we're actually talking about the piece of software that's running a simulation of the game in the, either in the, a bare metal server or a cloud server instance. Uh, and any time it's a either whatever's running the actual operating system underneath on the internet, we call that a machine. So we can either have bare metal machines or cloud machines, and they're running uh, game servers. You with me so far? So now I'm going to get into just some of the player metrics 
and the metrics we use to just talk about the number of players that we have. I'm sure you're all super familiar with seeing uh, lines like this. This is the CCU curve of a typical game over a, a one week period. And it goes up and down as things get in the way of playing games like working and sleeping. Um, but this is showing the CCU curve all the way through the week. Uh, that point there, that's the PSU, that's the peak of the week. Um, so that's the peak sequential users. Uh, and for this example, I've got about 20,000 peak sequential users in the game. But actually, if we break that down by region, we start to see some more information about what's going on during a 24-hour period. Because actually, different areas of the world obviously have different peak playing times throughout the day. Uh, so when if I take the stacking away from that, you can really see the individual regions, peaks and troughs, as they move through their 24-hour periods. Um, so in this example, Europe has got about a PSU of about 15,000. America has got 13,000. And then at the Asia, PSU is about 5,000. So it's really important to understand that although globally you have a peak of about 20,000, if you add up all of those individual regions, you can then work out how many players you're actually getting in each of your regions in total. So I did warn you there was going to be some maths involved in this talk, so here's the first little bit of maths. So if you total it up, actually the amount of capacity that you have to be running around the world to cope with those different peaks, in this example is about 33,000, with a regional split of about 45% in Europe, 40% in America, and about 15% in Asia which is fairly typical for a first-person shooter or a console-style game. Um, so some more things to talk about. Max CCU per game server. So that's really how many players can there be in a game at most. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in a moment about the average number of players per game server, because those numbers are often very, very different. Uh, and that gives us then the player density. So out of the amount of capacity we have available, how much of it is actually used by live players. So now that I've given you a good foundation of uh, things that we're going to be talking about in terms of our terminology, can I just have a quick show of hands of who's uh, launched a multiplayer game before? Put your hands up if you have. OK. Nice. And then uh, just a show of hands of who'd like to launch a multiplayer game in the future. Okay, a lot more. Good. So hopefully this will be helpful. Um, I'm going to run through the typical things that you actually do have control of when you're getting ready and you're planning for your launch. Uh, talk about the latency tolerance, because it's really important to think about that from the start. How you can plan your average CCU per game server, which regions you're going to launch in, um, your ga number of game servers per machine. I'm going to go into that. And then just talk about the bandwidth uh, that's impacted and how to plan for the bandwidth for your title as well. So kicking off with latency tolerance. Um, by that, it's really important to understand from very early on, even from design stages of your game, how much latency you will be acceptable to your game and to your match. Uh, if it was a turn-based card game, you could get away with a huge latency. If it's a first-person shooter, you're going to have to have a tiny, tiny latency. But what's really important is that you test your game um, on a remote server very early on in your development process. We find a lot of developers will uh, they'll start developing their game, they'll start testing it locally, they'll play it on a machine in the office, they'll connect to it, and they'll all think it's a fantastic experience. Then they release their game, it goes into a remote location, which introduces latency, uh, packet loss, and jitter. And all of a sudden, their game has a huge number of problems. So it's really important to test that as early on as possible. And if possible, test it in the environment you're going to go into production with. Um, so in terms of kind of working out your latency tolerance, if you had to have a high latency tolerant game, uh, you can get away with very few locations. So you could go one in America, one in Europe, one in Asia. That'll do you. That'll cover as many locations as you need. If you're then 
looking for something with about 150 milliseconds of latency. You might then split up East Coast, West Coast, US, and so that you get a better uh, round trip times for that marketplace. And I introduce the East West uh, European regions. Then if you're going to have a first person shooter, you need to have as many locations as possible to get down to like a sub 50 milliseconds latency time. So average CCU per game server. I'm afraid there's more maths coming. Uh, but it's really important to understand from your design stages of your game, if you're going to have different player modes and how many players they're going to be per session. This becomes incredibly important when you're planning your capacity. Because if you say, right, we're going to have 10,000 players in our game at any one point, so we need uh, tw two, we're going to have four players, so we'll have two and a half thousand sessions. Well, if you then had 10 players, obviously you need a quarter amount of the capacity. But that will impact your uh, overall performance. Also, mechanics like people being able to join games mid-session. Obviously, that will optimize and make sure your game's servers are full as much of the time as possible, but also understand what will happen if somebody leaves a game uh, during that session. Really important right now with the uh, games like Apex Legends and PUBG, where you know, if somebody dies in the first couple of minutes, normally me, uh, I'll leave and I'll go and I'll join another session. But that means that that slot that I had in that first session is still there available for me. So actually, the number of players that you're getting per session is significantly less than the maximum. So the important th way to think about it this is think about the, the PSU, or the peak number of players you've got playing the game, divided by the number of active game servers. This then gives the average CCU per game server, which is a very important metric to be able to monitor and track and look for ways to optimize this. Because the further you optimize this, the more it reduces your costs. So now, just onto regions. I spoke briefly about um, how you pick how many locations you want to optimize for the latency experience. But it's also important to think about which regions you're launching the game in. So it'd be very common not to have any locations in China if you can't if you can't publish in China, um, or if you're only targeting certain regions or English-speaking regions, you might optimize your locations based on that. Uh, if you were doing an Xbox launch, you'd probably want several locations in North America. But in Japan, the only people with an Xbox work for Microsoft. So there's not going to be much demand there. So you could have a fewer number of locations to maximize the matchmaking time, or minimize it. It's also really important to think about how the internet is actually wired up and connected. One of the really common mistakes we see a lot of people make when they're planning for their launch is to think that Australia uh, should join um, other players around Asia. Well, actually, because of the way the internet's connected, a lot of the internet traffic from Australia is actually routed via North America. So by making Australian players play with other players in Southeast Asia, it actually means that their traffic is actually often going all the way across the Pacific one way connecting through LA and then going all the way back over to Southeast Asia, which can have a huge impact on the latency experience. So it's actually much better to have those players either play with uh, other players in the west coast of the US or actually give them their own locations in Australia if you've got the amount of players there to make it a good player base. Um, so onto the game servers per machine. So it's really important to maximize efficiency to have as many game sessions per either bare metal or cloud instance as possible. Um, and it often comes down to two kind of important elements, which is whether your game is particularly CPU or RAM bound. So if it's a very fast paced first person shooter, quite often you'll run out of CPU, or the amount of gigahertz and the amount of threads that you'll have available to it before you'd ever run out of uh, memory. But if you have a, a large open world, which has got a lot of content in it, and it's going to be making a lot of changes to it, it could often mean that you'll run out of RAM before you'll run out of CPU. And it's important to understand how these metrics are going to impact your, uh, your game and to make sure that you get the most uh, efficiency out of your environment. Um, 
It's also important to understand the difference between uh, the different types of machines that are available. A bare metal server often has a significantly more powerful processor than a cloud server. Um, so a, you can run out of uh, CPU a lot faster in cloud than you can in RAM. And this means that you need to adjust the number of um, game servers that you have running in each of those environments. It's when you're planning for your launch, it's important to think about you, the granularity of your control. You could go to AWS or Google and get a huge 32 or 64 core uh, cloud instance. That's going to mean that you're adding a huge number of players per additional cloud server, and that might not give you the, the granularity of control. So it might mean that actually a smaller instance enables you to be more specific about how much capacity you're running at any one time. And think about if you had a, a cloud instance that could host 1,000 players, and you need 1,001 players' worth of capacity, you're going to automatically be running 2,000 players' worth of capacity, which is a huge waste and very inefficient. Um, and don't forget operating system costs. Uh, a lot of developers are very familiar with developing in Windows, so it's easy to make their game server in Windows. But you're going to have to be paying for that license. And in cloud, the Windows license can actually make up about a third of your costs. So if you can switch to Linux, it can be a huge cost saving. Um, and th think about the by machine management overheads, what we're talking about is the, if you start having to spin up and spin down servers regularly and go through the effort of getting that all set up, it can have a, make a lot of time for yourselves in terms of having to patch them, keep them updated, make sure they're all running, collecting logs and things like that. Also, the blast radius of a server. So again, back to that same principle, if you have a 1,000 players per cloud instance and something goes wrong with it and it, it crashes, that's going to impact 1,000 players. If you have a smaller cloud instance that's running one or 200 players and you have something go wrong with it, you're only going to lose one or 200 players worth of capacity. So it, these are all things you need to be thinking about when you're getting ready for your launch. And don't forget, while you're going through your development cycle, it's important to retest and rebenchmark all of these aspects because even small changes that you make to your game, even game features and new uh, additions could impact this, and that's going to impact the costs once you actually go into production. Uh, the last thing to think about is the kilobits per second uh, per player. And it's important to, again, be measuring this on a regular cadence when you're going through your development process. With cloud, you're going to be paying a huge amount for that egress bandwidth out of the cloud. Um, with bare metal, that bandwidth is often included, so it's going to have less impact. But you're going to want to think about how much bandwidth you're using. We were working with a, um, a studio over in North America. They were getting ready for the launch of their game. They were a couple of weeks away from it. And they realized that they had all the telemetry still running from when they were doing their development and testing and sending all of their telemetry back to the game server every frame in a 60 frame per second uh, a game. That meant that were, their bandwidth per player was about one and a half megabytes per second compared to an optimal game, which is about 12 kilobits per second. Uh, so they were about to face a huge bandwidth bill. Luckily, we were able to help them out and save them some money. Um, and going into that kind of the frame rate, if you're aiming for a, uh, a mobile game and you're going to have kind of 10, 20 uh, frames per second, and that's all going to be refreshing to the server, um, it's important to then think if you increase your tick rate, you're doubling the amount of uh, refreshes that are going back to the server. So that means you'll double your processing required, therefore doubling your, your compute bill. So now that we're in a little bit more control and we know what we're going to be talking about, it's important to th think about what the hosting options are for your game and how, how we can calculate the cost per CCU. Uh, as I mentioned, cloud is often slightly less efficient than bare metal, but it still plays a part because you've got that flexibility and that ability to spin up and spin down capacity as and when needed. So just as some examples, a Google Cloud instance, typically 2.6 gigahertz, a bare metal server, it's normally about 
And the prices that you have for that flexibility, you're paying a premium for that to have that flexibility. So a cloud server is typically seven or eight hundred dollars versus a bare metal server, which is less than half of that. So more maths warnings. Uh, the cost, if you think about the cost of your host machine, divide that by the number of game servers that you have per machine. And then you divide that by the average CCU per game server. This will then give you your cost price per connected concurrent user, which you c is a really important metric because with that, you can then calculate, OK, well, how much money do you need to make from your game in monetization to, to do that? But don't forget, the cake is always a lie. 100% uh, efficiency is not possible. And it means that you're never going to get that perfect result. And how often there'll be things that will impact that. So if you think if only half of your capacity online is ever used, it's actually going to double all of your cost per CCU. So hopefully, by embracing and thinking about all of these things that are going to impact your uh, costs, they'll help you get ready for it. And I'm running out of time, so I'm going to be quick. Uh, so think about how many players you're going to be expecting for your game. Don't worry. You're going to be completely wrong. You're, no one's ever got that number right. Um, but then you really just think about what it will take to, if you have more or less players and what you're going to do to adjust for that. Then think about what you're going to do if you get 10 times more players or 10 times less players than that and think about your plan. It's really important just to know your plan when you're getting ready for your launch and to know what's going to happen when these things impact you. Uh, but my last kind of note on this is it's dangerous to go alone, so take this. Uh, and that's what Unity and Multiplay do. So we help guide developers and publishers through this process to make sure that your games are a success. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm a little over. So.